Good morning, everybody. It is four days to Turkey Day, November 19th, 2021. I guess it's six days to Turkey Day, but it's a few hours options expiration. Lots of excitement. So the week after options expiration, I put up my aggregate holdings for everybody to look at. I don't break it down into portfolios. However, um, if you've been watching the very short list, you know that I've been adding tracking pages and we're going to start tracking all the trades a little bit more closely so you can at least see what's open and not open at a given time. Uh, if you want the uh, swing trades, you need to be a member of um, Fundamental Trends and follow those along in the chat room. Uh, I will cover some of those trades later in the uh, call, uh, show you some of Shooter's charts because if you're a swing trader, uh, they're pretty good charts. One of the things that he did this week, is he put up a chart for Apple and Basically, with us knowing that the market was getting choppy, he was able to point out that it looks like Apple is the one that's going to do well, and it has. And the thing I would point out here is that as the market breaks down with volatility uh, from being overbought and overvalued and overleveraged into the face of Fed tightening, um, this rush to quality is the first thing that normally happens. And that means that your big QQQ stocks, your Google, your Apple, uh, maybe Amazon, maybe Facebook, uh, are, are going to be the ones that hold up. Microsoft are going to be the ones that hold up in the short term. I would, if you're a trader, look in that direction to make some trades. Uh, however, if you're an investor, if you're mainly longer term like me, where you're trying to hold things for a minimum of half a year, but really into the two, three, four year period, you're going to have to be very careful because in a qualified account, right, your IRAs, there's no savings, right? There's no tax break for taking a loss. So in your IRAs, you should be very, very, very defensive and trim the heck out of your IRA holdings. And it's okay to hold cash for a little while. In your non-qualified accounts where you're taxable, Really, the only time you're going to sell there is, A, if you need the money, uh, B, if you think that something that you own could suffer a permanent loss over about 20%, right? Because at about a 20% loss, that's more than what you would pay in taxes for selling. So if you think there's something you own that has a chance of a permanent 20% loss, emphasis on the word permanent, right? Um, or at least really long-term loss, right? going into a five or 10 year period where it might not come back. And there's plenty of stocks that have done that. Take a look at GE. If you think that something that you own is facing a massive transition period into a weakening market, that's the one that you should probably take your profits on or cut your losses on. But in your non-qualified accounts, there's really not a ton of trading to do. Uh, I have non-qualified accounts that I manage where, you know, we're selling, they're, 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 they're supposed to generate income. So between the dividends and the option premium, you know, it's extra income. You wish that it was tax sheltered, but then again, as you pull income out of an IRA, you're taxed there anyway. So there's not really a way to get rid of income if you're actually looking, uh, tax if you're actually looking for income. But if you're looking to grow your investments long-term, it's really easy to manage your IRAs because you have no tax consequence for selling and, you know, putting the cash into dry powder for a little while. While, so this week I did a uh, really did two stocks of the week's article, and, and the the format of fundamental trends and margin of safety are, are mildly different for different editing reasons and copyright reasons, publishing reasons. But I covered some of the stocks that people asked about or that were in action. What I really focused on first, though, is that what are we looking at? And since the Fed announced it's going to taper, volatility has moved up, right? This is the Fed announcement right at the bottom, right at the bottom of the volatility. I mean, almost like the people who control big blocks of money were setting this up. I would never say that the market is manipulated. I would just say that the market is manipulated. And now that the volatility is going up, we probably should expect pretty good spike in the early next year at some point. And I don't know how it'll move along this line. But this really, 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 appears to me to be very similar to 2018. And if you were with me in 2018, remember that in December, I told you, hey, we should watch this volatility trade. 
In January, we got long volatility. And the most aggressive traders made 600% on that trade. I made like 50, 60% because I'm a scaredy cat and I manage other people's money. And always remember, you can be more aggressive than me because it's your money. When I manage your money, I'm going to be kind of at that conservative edge in most cases, holding extra cash, looking for bottom fishing prices, being a little bit more careful. You know, and there's going to be 20, 30 companies that I really want at least a small piece of just in case the market goes up forever. But in looking at the market right now, I'll tell you, this is the most similar to 1999 that I've ever seen. And the last time it looked like this was going into 2018 and again, going into 2020. And in 2018, we got those two corrections early in the year and late in the year. And in 2020, we got the correction early in the year. Everybody blames it on coronavirus, but I'll tell you what, we were going to get a correction in 2020 either way. And I think that 2020 was going to play out like 2018 if there wasn't coronavirus. Because you have to remember, without coronavirus, the Federal Reserve and the other central banks would not have doubled the amount of money pumped into the economy, global economy and markets that they had done over the previous 15 years. So the amount of money that went into the markets via the central banks from March and April of 2020 to just recently, and now they're all starting to taper, in that 18 months, they put more money into the system than they had in the history of central banks. Think about that. We I mean, really think about that. So that wasn't a bazooka. That was a monetary mushroom cloud. Oh, that was a monetary mushroom cloud. I blew my line there. I have to edit that. <laughs> um, I would expect a lot of choppiness next year. And if I had to guess, I'd say that we'd get a rally on volatility up to here, driving prices down. You'll get your dip buyers and your people who flip the switch. And you'll get falling volatility with a rally in the stock market, maybe through summer. But then I think Q4 of next year could look a lot like Q4 of 2020. And we'll see. Maybe uh, Laurel Brainyard will be the new Fed chairman. And if she is, then what I said about the Fed not following through on its taper plans could become true. Why is that? Well, it's because I told them not to. Not really. I expect Powell to be replaced. I do. Um, I don't know if he should be, but Mohamed El Arian made a real good point today on Bloomberg. He said, you know, at this point in the system, maybe we need an economist at the Federal Reserve and not a lawyer. But remember, Chairman Powell, I told you four years ago, wasn't really qualified for the job, but he adapted to it and he started listening to people. But there's certain things he doesn't listen on. Regulation is one of them trying to use monetary policy for social goals, the climate goals, or to reduce wealth inequality. He's not in on that. He just likes to pump money into the system when he can, because most of that money flows uphill. The wealthiest 1% of people in the world have gotten spectacularly more wealthy in the last 18 months. And then people like us have gotten the schnibbles, but 60, 70, 80% of the population has not benefited. So for those people who don't like the Federal Reserve because of all that, they don't really want to see Fed Chairman Powell continue. And I get it. I think they're going to win. I think Brainard is going to be the new Fed Chairman. I think that I came to that conclusion in the last week or so, listening to the reports. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Biden might not have the guts, but I will say Biden has showed a lot of guts so far as president. He is asked to do more in line with his agenda than any president's ever asked for since maybe Lyndon Johnson. So I would expect Brainard to become chief. And if she does, then this becomes a lot more likely that she will not completely end QE or it'll take longer. And I don't know that I see interest rates going up in the next few years. And if you're watching the bond rates this morning, suddenly the bond market decided that deflation was a story again. Short rates went down the most in a day, in like 40 years. Historic drop in short-term interest rate today. So I think we need to be aware of the fluidity of the situation. Regardless, when you have valuations that look like this, one of two things has to happen, and usually both things happen, and that is prices come down and it takes time for earnings to catch up. Well, with earnings at a record high right now, it might take a long time for earnings to get much higher. So what you could see 
is a very range bound stock market for a very long time. And you'll start to see separation between the quality and the growth companies versus the indebted low growth and zombie companies. So I was trying to figure out what I would call that separation of quality and growth from everything else. Because right now everything's high. And I was thinking the great bifurcation. I came up with something different and it appears in an article that should be up on Seeking Alpha later today. But that's really what you're going to see, a significant bifurcation. And being able to understand growth and quality is going to be very, very important. The I heard stocks, I heard this one's going to be okay. Or the they said stocks, well, they said this one's going to be pretty good. Those stocks are going to get beat to hell. And then the zombie stocks are going to be in bigger trouble. You need to be a very, very good stock picker, I think, for the rest of this decade. Lucky for me. But I also think that our four-step process, which focuses on secular trends at the top end, right? That's the first step, focus on big secular trends, is going to be super important too. And the millennials are pushing that, and they're doing pretty well with it. The stubborn old men who are the most likely to panic sell are the ones that are holding on to their oil stocks and, and various REITs and other things that they think are quality, even though they've been range bound for a decade or two, are the ones that are going to get crushed. So if you're an old man investor, and I say that as somebody who's becoming an old man, you better watch out. Because if you think that what worked in the 1970s and 80s is going to work now, you're so, so wrong. And if you think that the oil age is going to last decades and decades, you're so, so wrong. Assets that have declining terminal value never do well. They can have rallies in the midst of their decline like the oil stocks just had. But ultimately, any asset with declining terminal value, whether it's over the next 5, 10, or 100 years, is going to be fighting an upstream battle. You just don't want to own them. Another valuation of, another measure of valuation here. This is the Buffett indicator. This explains why he's pushing $200 billion in cash now. Now, you don't really need to focus on the big macro picture either. either. If you just know that valuations are super high, historically, they've always come back once or twice a decade, and then you buy them. And that's when you pull out your bucket, not your thimble. So we've been thimble investing for a, a long time, for two years. We missed a couple of trades, but ultimately, there will be a chance for you to fill your bucket with all sorts of quality and growth stocks. And that day is coming. One place where there's been a lot of growth potential has been in the mergers, and then the SPACs and then the IPOs. The IPOs have done pretty good. SPACs have been middle of the road. And if you take a look at SPAC track, you can see the whole history and what the returns are. They're not horrible, but they're not great. They look kind of like the stock market, which jives with something that I told you, oh, about a year ago. Once a company merges with a SPAC, it's just a company now, right? Now it's just a company. And you have to analyze it as just a company. So when you go to SPAC track, you want to find all the companies that have had a definitive agreement. You can go through this and you can see what their rates of return have been. There's all kinds of SPACs that have done really well. Lucid is up a ton. One of the DMYQ technology ones is up. We own one of these. We don't own that one, but we own one. So there's plenty of SPACs that have done well. The question was... How do you analyze these? You analyze them just like a company, right? What I just showed you really defies the whole idea that all SPACs suck. Now, clearly some SPACs suck. None of them have gone under yet, right? And some of them have done really well. That are just stocks at this point. So as I bought SPACs over the last nine months, I feel like I'm getting prices that were pretty close to bottom within a few bucks. And yeah, maybe something I bought at nine went to six. You know, that's life, man. That's just, that's just the life of short-term trading. I'm thinking about what are these companies going to be worth in two and three and four and five years? And if they execute, they have any luck at all, they're going to be worth a lot more, a lot more. Not a few bucks more, but like add a zero more or add two zeros, like some of those already did. Like Lucid, I expect it to lose half. Seriously, I think Lucid loses 50% of its value. So, so Rivian on the IPO side. Hey, there's a lot of hype in those. EVs are going to be a big deal, but there's an awful lot of players in the EV space. One of the reasons I'm in Ford, uh, in Ford, other than I love the real estate, I love their technology, I like their game plan, is they have a big hunk of Rivian. So if Rivian goes to the moon, that helps Ford too. 
So the cheapest way to play autos, in my opinion, is buy Ford on the dips. They have their own cars. They have a real estate portfolio that nobody values. They have technology that's some of the best in the world. One of only about 50 companies on the planet with with high-end AI-driven technology, your fourth industrial revolution stuff. Really, only 50, 60 companies in the world that have it. That's why the companies that have it are selling it to others. And if you think about Ford, you think about, well, they have real estate that they're not going to need as they shift to EVs. And supply chains are moving back to America. And all sorts of new supply chains are being developed for the new sustainable, smart everything world. And they got technology. Maybe they're going to keep doing deals like the one they did for the ventilators. And in fact, they are because they can program their machines to make almost anything. Those are the levels I think you need to think at when you invest in stocks. Now you can chase. If you're going to be a chaser, then understand that you're a chaser and learn how to do it well. Like Shooter. Shooter actually plays both ways, up, up and down. He was smart enough to understand that despite the market tightening up in the face of some of these overvaluations and rising volatility because of the Fed tightening, his chart told him, that Apple was probably going to rally, and it has. Put this chart up a few days ago. It's one of the only stocks that's been doing well in the last several days. And why does it go up? Well, the chart doesn't tell you why. It doesn't need to. It just needs to tell you that it's going to happen. The traders will attach all sorts of narratives to it that's wrong. The narrative that's probably right is one that's nobody talk, that nobody talks about, which is this is people running the quality in the face of doubts for other parts of the market. So flight to quality. How high can Apple go as a flight to quality? Well, you'll hear, you're, you'll hear people say to the moon, but as we learned with gold stocks a year and a half ago and all sorts of other stocks, is when margin calls happen, when people have to fund their accounts to pay off their debts, even the best stuff gets sold. Why? Because it has value. So Apple might be one of the last things to go down, but rest assured, when the margin calls start, it'll go down too. And when it does probably want to buy it, especially if you're a retiree. Apple and Microsoft are two of the best retiree stocks out there. They have like no risk of going to zero. Their dividends are increasing. They're both still big growth companies, right? They operate in oligopolies. If you're a growth investor, do you want to be an Apple and Microsoft? You know, maybe through QQQ, but there's not a lot of M&A coming from those two companies. Google, on the other hand, ton of M&A likely. So maybe you buy actual shares in Google at some point. And if you think that AWS is going to spin off from Amazon, maybe you buy some shares in Amazon. Because I think AWS is going to get three, four, five hundred percent bigger. And my guess is that management separates them out at some point. We'll see. So where is the market? Not only is it overvalued, but you have almost a hundred stocks that are overbought on the S&P 500. These are just VSL stocks. All sorts of stocks that are overbought. I wanted to see just how many. It's the most I've ever seen. And there are 411 stocks on the S&P 500 trading over their 200-day moving average. That like never happens. I think it was a little higher recently in, in, in September or August. You have over 80% of the S&P 500 stocks trading above its two, their 200-day moving average. That means like nobody has been going down for 200 days, except the small caps, right? This is S&P 500. Of the large caps, they are crazy crazy overvalued. And that's happening as margin debt is soaring and call volume is through the roof again. So let's talk about leverage. Leverage is when you try to take a little bit of money and spin it up into a lot of money. And with the calls, if your call price, your strike price doesn't get hit, your call goes to zero. And in a margin account, if you don't maintain the level of assets that you need to maintain, you get a margin call. Right now, there are a lot of people, not really any way to know exactly, but it's in the millions, millions of people using margin to buy calls that can go to zero. There are a lot of people that the next time there's a correction are going to lose a lot of money because not only are their calls going to go to zero, they're going to get margin calls and they're going to own money. But here's the thing that we know. The millennials, even though they're going to take a lump, aren't really the ones to worry about because as the article that will pop up any minute now, I was hoping it would be up already, shows... As we know, the older male investors are the ones that panic sell. Decades of data show that. And it's not universal. It's not every single person. But that's the general trend. Is the most likely people to panic sell 
are your older males who probably feel like they're supposed to take care of the family. They get scared. Oh my God, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do as a patriarch. Rather than making a smart decision, they get emotional and they sell. My experience with millennials is this. They're much less emotional, at least when it comes to their money. Different types of fighting and emotional with them than the boomers. We all know that the Xers like me are the only level-headed people out there. <laughs> Sometimes I make myself laugh. So anyway, <laughs> the likelihood here is that as the market gets beat up and more volatile, you get this spiral down because the typical people who panic sell will, will panic sell. And a lot of them own ETFs and other mutual funds. And then those are forced to sell. And the market goes down until one of two things happens. It gets bailed out by the government or the Fed, or the people with dry powder decide, okay, this is cheap enough for me to buy blood in the streets. My expectation is that the Fed under Brainard will try to engineer a soft landing, but they're not going to prevent the bear market. They don't want to see 50, 60, 70% losses across the board. 20, 30, 40, I think they can live with. Because that repairs this chart and this chart. So all the people who said the Fed has my back and that's why I can borrow and speculate, I think they're wrong. And I think that certain people already know that because the stock market's already getting hyperactive. I normally don't get but 10 or 12 volume alerts in a given day. Yesterday, I got 46. I'm only tracking 350 things. So way over 10% of the things that I track traded way over their normal volume. I get an alert whenever a stock trades 70% or more above its normal volume or 30% above for an ETF. Those are pretty high volume thresholds. I mean, there's usually four, five, six days a year when something trades that much above its average volume. And now you're getting over 10% of the things I track going way above their average volume. That, I mean, that means it could hit everything in the market in just three or four weeks. So as the volume goes up, you just have to say, hmm, what's next? And I don't know the shape of things to come. You know, one of the reasons I incorporate Elliott Wave and I eyeball it more than applying the, you know, granular analysis that Shooter does, I've been eyeballing it for 20 years almost, is because there are patterns of behavior that you have to accept. And again, I'm not talking about you specifically, I'm talking about the herd. And what I'm hoping is that you're separating yourself from the herd. I don't want you to be in the herd. And I hear talk, I see the chat, and people talk in a way that clearly places them within the herd. I started writing an article a long time ago, and I don't even know where it might be. I'm going to try to find it for you, though. I think you just see some of the articles that I've started. I got 159 articles started over the last several years. Here's one I wrote in 2019, April 2nd, 2019. I'm skeptical of Tesla bears. <laughs> And that was because that Montana skeptic was all over seeking alpha. I wonder if I bumped it up. I'm going to write this one. I already mentioned the phrase, liquidity speaks, sentiment listens. Where did all the U.S. government debt go? There you go. To beat the market, stop thinking like the market. And I worry when I see people talk about, well, this thing went up for the last few months, so I'm going to buy it. Or this thing did this. I'm going to, I'm going to chase the crowd here. I'm just going to tell you, unless you are spectacular a technical analysis. It is very hard to be a chaser if the government and the Federal Reserve aren't helping you out. I, this might be your last warning. If you think that you're a great trader, but you can't recite line and verse, the technical rules that you follow and understand each one, then you're not a great trader. And you better be very careful. Shooter over at Fundamental Trends said, what, two weeks ago, that a lot of the charts were breaking, that he is inclined to make very few trades, and he's probably setting up to do some shorting at some point. And he gave you Apple basically as a flight to safety trade. And it might not last forever. So as this market continues to shake out, the short attacks on small and mid caps will continue. Happened the Stone Company this week, but it looks like it leveled out, and it looks like somebody is starting to buy it. These green lines indicate buyers. We saw Kathy Woods buy almost 300,000 shares. And if Berkshire Hathaway is buying this, we'll know from a filing in the next week or two because they're allowed to buy in secret short term. Go down here, take a look at Jumia. 
Jumia came out on a short attack, but it really didn't get beat up too bad, just a few bucks. If you don't know what this company is, it's basically a mini Amazon in Africa and the Middle East and Eastern Europe, primarily Africa. And they're on the verge of profitability in a huge growing market. I encourage you to watch this video. If you're a growth investor and you haven't nibbled on Jumia, you should. Amidas, right, carbon capture, and we've sold puts on this a few times. I don't know if anybody actually bought the shares down at 10, but if I'm right, and the price of oil and gas just peaked, and it's going to drift down now and be range bound, then you need to buy the dips on this one, but you don't want to chase it in the very short term. So it's been coming down from 23, it's down to like 18 now. There's some puts that you can sell, and if it gets back to around 10, you'll load up. I texted the CEO the other day, so we're trying to set up an interview. But this is one that could get beat up like Jumia and Stone uh, in the short term, because the shorts have the power to gang up on things. So it is not unlikely that this gets all the way down here. But I do love the company. In large and mega caps, somebody asked about PayPal. Uh, so it's looking like it's ready to be bought. I don't think so. I think down around 150 is where I'd be interested. And if it goes below that, for sure. I do think that the upside on PayPal is four to $500, three, four, five years out because of the way that the financial system is moving. But remember, my criteria is that I don't really like to buy a growth stock unless I think it can do better than triple in that three, four, five year window. So for me to think that PayPal is going to triple needs to get to around 150. That would make me think, okay, big company, steady growth. I get a value price for that growth right there. This area right in here is important. Now I was talking to Shooter before the call. Some of you heard, I don't draw all my stuff on here. I don't because you want to understand it and it'd just be a pain to keep updating. I have basically taken the indicators that I use, which are, some of them are down here. You know, then you have your volume, volume weighted buying and selling pressure. And I just put in an orange box and we could stay a little above it. We get a little below it, but this is basically my buy zone. I'm going to usually buy a little here in a normal market. And then if it gets to here, I'll buy there. I don't think this is a normal market. So I'm pretty much ignoring this top line across the board and looking for bottom feeding prices or below. If I thought we were still in a raging bull market that was going to go on for another year or two, I'd buy up here and look for the bounce. I don't know what could prolong a bull market in the face of Fed tightening. Roku, I actually think there's a very fundamental reason why this one's falling, and that's competition. Competition and shrinking margins. Pretty simple. Amazon, Apple, Google, right? The cable companies, everybody's trying to squeeze Roku. And they're getting competition on the streaming platforms. Roku was an early mover, but they don't have anything that's proprietary to the point where it can't be copied pretty easy. But Apple TV, Amazon Prime, now, now YouTube, they all do the basic streaming things that you need. You can put other services on their platforms. And as I told you, AT&T, Comcast, and the other cable providers, they're just going to put a streaming platform right on their wire or on their wireless signal. Roku filled a need and pioneered something, but it's not something that can't be copied. Pretty easy. And I'll tell you, I have two Roku TVs, some TCLs. Got them at Costco. They're pretty cheap. They're great TVs. And they have Roku built right in. Here's the thing. I don't need it anymore. So when I get my next TV upgrade in two, three, four years, whenever it is, I'm not going to be married to Roku. <coughs> and if I want, I can throw Roku away just put everything on my Amazon platform, which would make my life real easy because I use Amazon all the time. Or maybe I'll tie it to YouTube because I use YouTube all the time. Maybe I'll just put it on my cable or wireless providers platform. I don't think I'll do that because I'm not married to AT&T. Somebody comes out with a better wireless plan or faster fiber or something or for the next time I move, uh, I'll shop that. So for me, I'm probably likely to use Amazon or YouTube forever, but I might switch my cable or wireless provider or fiber provider. So while I think Comcast and AT&T, several other companies are going to have pretty viable competition for Roku. I actually think Amazon and YouTube are coming for them. I think Roku's got a very fundamentally problematic business model at this point. I mentioned it to you the first time months and months ago. That's why I took Roku off the plug and play about a year ago. This technology is changing so fast. I actually think that's bad for Roku. If it gets down to $160 a share, I'll take a look at things then. But I think there's a pretty good possibility 
you see Roku way down here in the double digits. I think you can see it lose 70 or 80% from here. So be careful. If you own it, I think it's one that you ought to take your profits on. And then Disney, I talked about this week too. Here's my problem with Disney. I have never been able to figure out why they can't make that company a million times bigger. I don't know what the problem is with Disney. I truly don't. I think maybe they need to split off the entertainment business from the theme parks. Think theme parks. I think maybe they need to cut a deal with Universal. Right? I talked about Viacom, CBS, and NBC merging, and they're already doing some work. Maybe Disney ought to get into that. Right? But they already own ABC, so I don't know. But maybe they should split off the theme parks into a REIT. To me, that makes a lot of sense. I'm not really sure how Disney resolves itself, but Disney should be a three, four, five hundred dollar stock just based on the streaming side. Disney, Star Wars, Marvel, Pixar, National Geographic. I mean, they're the only real competitor to the Discovery Warner Brother behemoth. It's going to come and be next year as a spinoff from your AT&T shares. So I don't know. I don't know how Disney gets fixed. Here's what I know. At some point, they are either going to announce their fixing plans or they're just going to get so cheap again that you have to buy them and then just hold your nose and wait for them to get fixed. Maybe they should sell ESPN. I don't know. I actually think they should spin off the parks into a REIT. So if this goes down in here, even if they don't have a plan announced to fix the company, I think you just buy it and you say, well, they'll figure it out. Because that streaming side of the business, it's it's worth as much as Netflix. And Warner Brothers Discovery is going to be worth as much as Netflix. Now, Netflix might come down a little bit, but the other ones are going to catch up one or the other. So the last thing I'm going to give you, because we were going to talk about cannabis all day today, and we're not. I didn't get time to finish that article with my daughter having a baby, and I've been babysitting Dom a lot. I'm going to go pick him up in two hours and keep him overnight. So I'm going to be a very tired grandpa. But the cannabis stocks have really started to come down hard. They've been coming down since January, and that market is doing nothing but getting bigger and bigger. So Shooter is saying between 15 and 17 is where to buy it, which is where I said to buy it. So right now, right now, you should be looking at this cannabis ETF. Can it get down here? Absolutely. But I've already nibbled in once. So I nibbled in once because it's already a ton down. Doesn't mean it can't go down a little bit more. It can. But there is news that Canopy replaced a couple of executives today. And that is the first step for all these companies is to adjust to the world we're in. Not just the hype, but the adoption of the models and the growth. So I've shown you the hype cycle curve and a lot of a lot of these stocks, right? Hype, valley of death, valley of despair, whatever you want to call it. And then they'll start going back up. So you can quibble about where you buy it in here, but eventually there's new highs and it'll be way up there. So you're going to see this go much higher. I would guess that many of these companies, and remember the ETFs are self-correcting. They get rid of their losers. The winners in cannabis are going to make a fortune, a fortune, marijuana and cannabis. So you really want to get in here as a long-term play somewhere in the teens on this ETF. If you want to use MSOS, you can use MSOS, right? They pretty much attract each other. They're pretty close. They're both pretty new funds. MSOS is actually bigger now. You can use either one. I don't know that there's much difference. I like the uh, Seymour one because I think that he's a great manager. But it wouldn't hurt you to own a little bit of both. Slightly different baskets. One's more passive, one's more managed. But I'll have an article comparing all the cannabis marijuana ETFs in the next week or so. Um, and I will have a number of companies that have invested in cannabis that have other businesses that can benefit as well. So if you don't want pure plays, I'm going to give you some hybrid plays too. And then uh, I am going to be interviewing Dr. Sean Stein Smith again. I was thinking maybe on Wednesday, but we'll figure it out and I'll get it posted. But we're going to be talking about stable coins and how they might manifest and how that influences the development of crypto. And it was interesting to me that Sailor said something today. He said, look, the world's dying for two things, digital gold and digital dollar. Here's a big Bitcoin guy saying the digital dollar. So everything that's going to be involved with the digital dollar is going to be very bullish. And all the things that try to fight the digital dollar are going to be very bearish, which I've been telling you for a long time. So when I look at PayPal and I look at Square and I look at Stone and I look at Jumia 
part of that has to do with the evolution of currency going digital and who are going to be the players in that domestically and globally. So again, think about the big themes and then drill down from there. Understand that the Fed and the government change timelines all the time. So you don't want to fight them when they're tightening. And even though you have an infrastructure bill and a reconciliation bill coming, still way smaller than the stimulus from coronavirus. So really monetary and fiscal policy are both tightening up. The federal deficit last year was 12%. We spent 12% more than we brought in. Next year, it's going to be around 4 or 5%. It was 8% less money than the federal government is spending. So everybody wants to talk about, all oh, the Democrats, this, blah, blah, blah. Fact of the matter is the deficit is shrinking again, just like it did under Obama, just like it did under Clinton. So don't let biases get in the way. Just look at the data. And that's where you can be data-driven. Treasury is issuing a lot less treasuries. Why could that be? Because the government is borrowing less. Federal Reserve isn't buying treasuries. Why? Because treasuries aren't getting issued. So they're tightening. Again, I don't really know how long I believe that to occur because I still think that deflation is the boogeyman, but we'll see. We'll see if they finish tightening on the QE. Maybe they won't raise it again in the short term, but maybe they stop bringing it down as fast as they're bringing it down. And if Brainard is the new chairman come January, she could pretty quickly tap the brakes on how much they're bringing it down. Maybe instead of 15 billion a month, it's 6 billion a month, 8 billion a month. Because I don't think the government really wants to wind down the mortgage-backed securities. And I think that at some point, they probably still have to buy some treasuries, at least to roll things over. But there is a little window between where the maturities are that for the next three years or so, three or four years, the QE is just kind of in the background. We'll see. I hope to build back better, builds back better. Looks like it's going to. I hope that China and the United States work together a little bit better. I hope that China says, hey, we'll work out some sort of federation as long as, you know, Everybody says the right things with Taiwan. There's a lot of good things that could happen with dialing down the adversarial nature of things and by broadening the wealth base. So anything that broadens the wealth base is probably good for the world. That's always been the case. We'll see what happens. But one of the realities is demographics drive the economy, and there are major deflationary forces for decades yet aging of the boomers, which is going to be followed by the aging of the millennials, and then smaller, consistent generations after that. Until we get to the consistently, you know, just self-replacing generation phase, which will basically is just starting, so 40 years out maybe, we're going to have deflationary pressure. And that's why probably have low interest rates for a very long time, and QE keeps coming back to pull us out of the potholes. And in that environment, we do want to buy the dips. But given where valuations are, there's probably a pretty big dip coming. So just be prepared for it. Don't be afraid of it. Use it as an opportunity to put your bucket out. All right. Any incredible questions today? Kirk, what is the best way to protect 401k and limited to a few index funds? If there's a short-term bond fund, I think that that's probably a good place to put half of your money or even the money market. You almost always have a money market option or the target date fund that's closest to you, so like a 2025 target date fund, will be the most conservative one, right? The ones that are furthest out and the most aggressive. So you could do that too. Oh, somebody else asked about 401ks. Given the overbought nature of large caps, would you recommend perform uh, position your 401k uh, differently? Yeah, I, I, I've told everybody that if you're concerned about how it might impact you, I don't think it's a horrible idea to get around half of your money and to try powder. You know, I, I just think it's a pretty good idea. And I don't usually go more than half. I mean, I guess you could go three quarters right now. I think it's that overvalued and that tenuous. But just understand, you better have a plan of action to scale in. That's a plan, not just like, well, I'll know when to scale in. Because you, you might not. You just have to be able to get in, into, in th- you know, two or three pieces, probably three, you know, using using some basic levels. Oh, here we go, right? I'm going to buy here. I'm going to buy here. I'm going to buy here. And that's just the way it is. Why? Because it's all lower than here. Scale in and don't let your emotions be part of the equation. Oh, Teresa says she bought her opening position at AMTX at 954. Humble brag. Uh, no, no changes in the satellite SPAC basket. There's five satellite companies that I'm in, you know, a couple percent in each one so far. Planet is the one that's already moving up. 
Uh, that's DMYQ. So I'll get the shares and the warrants on what, December 2nd or 3rd, they said. If you don't already own DMYQ units, um, I would buy some shares as a starter and then sell some puts. Can I shed some light on Palantir? It's a spy company with AI that companies, big companies and governments use. You know, and that's the type of question that makes me think, are you just watching the price movement? Look, stocks get beat up from time to time. When liquidity shrinks in the market, they get beat up. That's all there is to it. Palantir has the ability to become a monumental, the huge company, right? Does this really look like all that much is happening? It's just bouncing around my buy zone. Could it go down here? For sure. I mean, I, could it get to 15, 16? Absolutely. And that's why you break up your buys into three areas. Buy, buy, sell a put, sell a put, buy, 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 sell a put, buy, whatever, whatever the case might be. Buy, buy, buy. You could do that too. And I think it's important to look back at Stone for here for a second, or actually any of these stocks. You know, there's something called Martingale theory, Martingale gambling ideas, right? gambling systems. And people buy, because, oh, it was down 5% this week. I'm going to buy it again. If you've noticed, my buy prices are pretty far apart, 10, 15, 20% apart. That's how you scale in. Don't worry about single digit price fluctuations. Pay attention to double digit price fluctuations. So with Palantir, I was looking at 25 and 21. Well, that's $4. It's about 15, 16% difference between the two spots that I buy. I didn't buy at 25 and 24 and 23 and 22 and get overextended. I bought here, actually I sold puts up here and they're going to get put to me today because I have $25 puts today. So I'll have Palantir at 25 minus the 230 or whatever I got in premium. So 23 is my net cost. And now it's at 2158. So probably in here, maybe next week I'll sell more puts because now I'll have shares and I don't need to buy it again. I'll just take some premium in. If I get it down here at 18 or 20 or whatever option I sell, that's fine too. And we'll see how things look on Monday. I'm going to put out a pretty big option piece on Monday night. I'm not going to have it done on Sunday. I want to get it done Monday night because I want to see how the week starts. And then the week after option expiration, that's the week that I put out my aggregate holdings every month. I haven't been real consistent with that, but I started doing it because I know you want it. So I'm putting out my aggregate holdings in an article every month about a week after option expiration because that's when everything gets put to me or called away. And I usually make corresponding trades that week. So with Thanksgiving this week, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out. I might have to do an update a week later though. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, once a month, I'll put up my actual aggregate holdings. And uh, like I said, on the VSL, you'll see that one, I added the charts back in, starting to update those. And sustainable growth trade tracker, dividend trade tracker, cash secured put trade tracker, the covered call trade tracker. So these will all be operational sometime in December. Just haven't had, if somebody wants to build these for me, you're more welcome. Um, but I have to get these built. So I'll probably just find something that I like and copy it. All right. Have a great weekend. I am going to shower up, take the Hulk to the museum again. And then it's to the safe house. If you've not been to the safe house in Milwaukee and you come to Milwaukee, go to the safe house. It's a kind of a spy and magic, uh, sort of place. Got to know the password to get in. And if you don't know the password, you have to do a little dance in the alley and then they let you in. But yeah, I would Google Safe House Milwaukee. It's pretty cool. Tomorrow, two grandmas with the Hulk, maybe Costco, maybe a little bit of Home Depot, maybe Bed Bath & Beyond. All right. Take it easy, everybody.